Atena kouta kato, ahe mi ki te ato e fakakuro ore a tō nengoa, ahe mi ki te kingi Māori. Uh, Kei te mi ki, ki aia o tira me tono whare kahoi a riki, noi tonu a rire, rire hau pai marire ki a, ki a rātau pai marire ki a tātau. Uh, tēnā koutou e ngā rangatiro ngā hau e whā. Um, I've got 15 minutes to explain our um, project and it's going to be a challenge. Although, may I ask, can I encroach on the time that was left from the others? Mm. <laughs> and see how the machine works. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm talking about, our, um, about the law, or the laws of New Zealand, the first law being tikanga Māori, or Māori customary law, and conventional law and mainstream law, and how they apply over our marine space and uh, the interface, some of the challenges, and uh, some of the enablers. First, remembering doing it in the context of our Sustainable Seas vision, which has been talked about. If you want to know more about our project, come and see me later. Uh, we have a team, there's some of our team members, and I've got three of them at the back there, if they can just stand up, please. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Regina Sterling, Ms. Mylene Narakin, and Ms. Mary Jones. Thank you. If you have any questions, see them. <laughs> Especially if they're hard ones. <laughs> right, so um, in terms of our co papa looking at the, um, our legal systems, how they interact, what the challenges are, and so on, remembering that tu hono hono, the word means a binding or coming together. Um, our method, we looked at literature reviews, we in interviewed some key informants in the Te Tau Ihu focal area, and we did some comparative work over in the US and Canada. Um, these are the literature reviews we actually did, and they'll be available at the end of this month. So we've done one on um, EBM, looking at it globally and the different, uh, I guess, approaches to EBM, and I concur with what's been said earlier by the other presenters, how there's no one way to implement it. It's context specific, it's adaptive and so on. But we've got a lovely uh, literature review on that as well as tikanga, rahui and so on and so forth. My time's carrying on so I'll just carry on here. Uh, oh, and we um, carried out some interviews, as I mentioned, in the Te Ihu area, so the focal area and a bit broader. So we interviewed some uh, key informants from uh, Ngati Kuata, uh, Ngāti Toa Rangatira, uh, Te Atiawa, Ngāti King uh, Kuia, Ngai Tau, and a couple of others. And again, talk to our, inform talk to our um, my colleagues in more detail, if you want um, who it was and where and so on. Now, um, ecosystem-based management has been defined already, so you can have a look at that later. You know all about this one. Let me just say some key points about ecosystem-based management with regards to tikanga Māori, and I'm assuming you know about tikanga Māori. I don't have enough time to get into it. But um, <clears throat> tikanga Māori is congruent with ecosystem-based management and as the uh, sustainable seas. Um, early presentations, our, our research findings on ecosystem-based management uh, notes that tikanga Māori is fundamental, is one of the key pillars of ecosystem-based management and its implementation in New Zealand here. Mm. So we must acknowledge uh, our mātauranga Māori, tikanga Māori, but it is all congruent in terms of another key, th key aspects of tikanga Māori is its values not rules-based. It's not based on what the law says, which is prescriptive. It's the values and the whole thing that we're trying to achieve. It's holistic. It's ecocentric, not anthropocentric. So people are part of the environment, not over the environment. Human beings are, we're a key part with the rest of the environment. It's also relational. In fact, tikanga Māori is a law of relationships. Mm. Mm. As is uh, ecosystem-based management. Um, and all of these principles, incidentally, were recognised in the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. Um, unfortunately, we lost our way, particularly about 1877. A mm. hundred years later, we started finding our way again in terms of recognising tikanga. And uh, interestingly, our environmental challenges too. Mm. Um, and so we have to recognise and acknowledge our Māori legal systems, laws, institutions and values when we're implementing EBM. 
to enhance and protect our environment. Tikanga Māori is also fundamentally collaborative and it's uh, relational and it's about balance. Right? It's all about balance. When we violate the environment, it puts the world out of balance and so we need to right it. Same with, with human beings, same with all aspects of our ecosystem. So on that note, when we interviewed and looked at the literature, what are the challenges of tikanga Māori and mainstream law in New Zealand? Um, interestingly, so tikanga Māori is included in literally hundreds of statutes and regulations in New Zealand. So it is enabling in that um, perspective. It's where they're incorporated in a strong way, actually, and a lot stronger than many other nations. And we acknowledge how we're ahead in some of these areas. So there's numerous statutes, numerous uh, regulations. Um, there's specific settlements we've had, settlement legislation. We have other special legislation over uh, national parks and so on, which again, we're world leaders in, in many respects. And also our co-management agreements and arrangements, not unique to us. They're going on in Australia and the US and Canada and other places. Um, but some of ours are unique, particularly when you look at the uh, legal personality of uh, the Uruera National Park and the Whanganui River. Those were world leading. Of course, it's still too early to know what the implications are long term, but that's about recognising as best we can in a statutory form, Māori world views. Right? Māori refer to our environment as being an ancestor, as us being related to them. And granting <coughs> these um, natural resources uh, legal personality as a way to give expression and more to that world view. Uh, in our interviews, these are what some of our uh, key informants said, some of the key enablers. Again, we don't have time to get into it, but these are some of the key words they used. Trust, um, rights, um, management, governance, talking, negotiation and so on and so forth. In terms of our limitations, what are the challenges for tikanga Māori at that interface? These are what some of our <coughs> the key terms that some of our uh, key informants mentioned. So some of our challenges are again, ironically, trust, uh, having space for Māori to participate, um, acknowledging Māori knowledge, hmm. um, the law, treaty settlements, legislation, and so on. So ironically, it seems to be some similar terms that are used as enablers and limits. So just to um, <coughs> drill deeper, in New Zealand, so we have many uh, areas, much law that acknowledges tikanga Māori values, concepts, and institutions, as well as the treaty itself. Right? So we're world leaders in that respect. The challenge, however, and if I can say this in a nice political way, is <clears throat> it's nice having these concepts and more the challenge is implementation. Right? Right? So they're nice on paper, but actually putting it into practice is the challenge um, where these tikanga concepts aren't given substantive effect in practice. And also, as um, Jim mentioned earlier, one of the big challenges for Māori too in terms of co-management Agreements, for example, Māori are a treaty partner for environmental management, but a big challenge for a lot of our people is capacity one, and also resources, being adequately resourced to carry out their partnership duties and obligations and um, to be sitting at the table there and to carry it out effectively. Now, in saying that, we looked overseas and I mentioned I recently returned from Canada about three weeks ago uh, working with some uh, fascinating First Nations groups over there. Uh, one of the key insights I pulled up from them, I learned from them, um, from the uh, Potawatomi in Oklahoma. Their chief said to me when we were talking to him about what are the challenges for them, and they said, um, well, one of our key challenges is we need to be at the tables of power. Right? We must be at the tables of power, which Māori are starting to... Uh, you know, be there at those tables of power. And he said this to us. He said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Hmm. <laughs> right? And um, I was going to say, for many years, Māori have been on the menu. Hmm. 
Now we're wanting to be at the table, but when we're at the table, we need to be adequately resourced. That responsibility a lot is our own, but it's also help if the councils and others can assist with that so that we can be treaty partners and we can reflect that uh, partnership as well as sharing these key points, uh, these key values about our tikanga because they are actually valuable for our country. They are what make us distinct, plus they worked fundamentally, historically for millennia. That's how we survived, that's how we protected the environment and our relationship with the environment. Um, and just to give um, a practical example of this lack of implementation is in the Resource Management Act, Section 33. I'm sure most of you know that section. But that's the section where um, local authorities, local government can grant to Māori authorities. They can devolve power to them. Mm -hmm. Where Māori can sit at the table with them and have that power. And it's a statutory provision. As far as I can tell, it hasn't really been implemented since 1991. Hmm. So since the commencement of the Resource Management Act, which remembering at the time too, when the RMA was enacted, that was a radical statute globally. Hmm. Right. That was radical in terms of we were actually taking a, a, an effects approach or a slightly ecosystem-based approach in that legislation. Um, Depending on your view, it's been a challenge whether we've uh, accomplished it. But I can say this, um, <clears throat> and this is clear, our environment is deteriorating at a radical rate, at a terrible rate. And so if we need, if we want new results, we need to make some radical changes. <laughs> if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. <laughs> right? We need radical changes. 70% of our rivers are polluted. What do I say now? With respect to the scientists again, the test for a lot of our waterways is whether they're wadeable and you don't get sick. I'm not that old, but I used to swim in our lakes and rivers, and the key for us was being able to swim and put your head under and be protected and to grab, catch some kai from there too, right? And enjoy it, not just wading in it. Uh, and so we need to make some radical changes. Māori also is subject to the tyranny of, of majority. So what we need is authority, resources and capacity. Now, um, some great overseas lessons. The Great Bear Initiative is a, a, an awesome uh, <clears throat> example of ecosystem-based management in Canada. This is in BC, central and northern BC. Um, I met with the leaders here when I was in Canada and looking at the different things they're doing, but they're taking a, a collaborative approach between the different nations in BC, which is a challenge, same as for Māori too. Admit that. As we always say, oh, wait, two minutes left. As we always say, Māori usually only do really well together in a game of rugby. <laughs> <laughs> We want to extend it to the environment too. But we can do that. That's initiatives on us. The Great Bear Initiative is a, a good example of that, but also working with um, the provincial government and other stakeholders, NGOs, they've come together and working in an amazing way to preserve the forest, but also the marine area. Um, there's a number of examples throughout the US that I have visited, but I need to go back and visit more of them. It's a different context there, but they have reservations where they have, uh, these are the coastal ones, they have residual sovereignty, so that's sovereign nations, they can pass laws, they have an executive, they have a judiciary and so on, and they have some jurisdiction over the marine space on their reserve. Right? Challenges past the reserve. Okay. So I need to do more work there. So in summary, uh, from our research, what we've found is um, rather than the RMA and other legislative provisions, including Local Government Act and so on, what's actually made more of a difference for Māori is treaty settlements. So it's these negotiated agreements, not these generalised statutory provisions uh, and co-management agreements, which are new partnerships. Again, the challenge, however, is um, resources and authority but being at the table is important. Um, and there's some examples there. Uh, there's other new statutory provisions which appear to be quite um, world leading again. Um, some very optimistic uh, opportunities there, particularly section 58 of the Resource Management Act, which was passed last year, uh, allowing for iwi participation agreements or mana whakahuno arohe.
Um, and there's some great opportunities there, which gives Māori a bit more jurisdiction and authority to negotiate with local councils. So it's a bit more power. Oh, last 10 seconds. And we need a radical approach, and EBM must include tikanga Māori. Goodwill. And also we need some jurisdiction too. I've got 20 seconds. <laughs> so I'll take it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, key challenges. Once you're at the, at the uh, negotiating table, the tables of power, you need that authority, those resources, and the capacity to exercise it. Mm. And that's how I believe uh, EBM will be uh, implemented more effectively here in New Zealand, and again, including tikanga Māori, mātauranga Māori. Kia ora tātou. Mm.